Have you seen the slash? Made by users for users. Engineered for flavor. One of the coolest features around. A built-in loading tool. Learn more at www.stonesmiths.ca. What's happening? We'll tell you right now on This Week in Cannabis News. My good friend David Wiley from Okanagan Z joining me on This Week in Cannabis News. You can find them on Twitter at Okanagan Z and you can obviously find them online at okanaganz.com. Uh, David, it is great to see you once again. We've uh, conquered technology as we are <laughs> masters of this device. So good to see you again. How are you doing? Back in business. Oh, life is good. It's good to see you too, my friend. How are you, you doing? Gotcha. I am good. I'm good. Uh, the sun is trying to poke through where I am. So uh, by the time I'm finished recording today, I hope it'll be a nice sunny day and I can get out and, and enjoy things and, and possibly enjoy some legal cannabis, which citizens of Mexico could be enjoying legally at some point. We don't know when, but we do know um, it's on the way. And, and we know what that feeling was like. We remember when legalization was announced and then we had to patiently or impatiently wait for it to happen. But what do you think of this story? I was definitely very impatiently waiting for it to happen. Yeah. It's great to see Mexico on the verge of becoming the world's largest market for legal pot. Uh, cannabis advocates, however, got to say, not necessarily impressed with the current legislation. And they're actually lobbying hard right now to change it. Uh, right now, they say that uh, there's these draft laws would actually favor large corporations over small businesses and family owned farms. Um, further, they're saying that the current draft law would do little to address the issues at the root of the country's illegal drug trade. So not necessarily dissimilar from what Canada saw, where the laws came under scrutiny and we wanted to make sure that so we really hit those high notes, so to speak, of um, ensuring that the legacy market was um, overshadowed, let's say, by the legal market. And part of the solution for that in Canada, which advocates in Mexico say uh, is also an issue there, is ensuring that current growers are able to transition into the legal market <clears throat> because that will, of course, increase the quality uh, and it will lower the competition. The time to make changes to these laws right now is limited under court order. Mexican lawmakers have until mid-December to finalize the rules. Uh, uh, Julio Salazar, who's a senior lawyer and legalization advocate with the nonprofit group Mexico United Against Crime, has told the Washington Post that He's not sure if the initiative being pushed by Congress will actually make things better at the moment. Um, basically says that it, it makes a cannabis market for the rich and continues to use criminal law to perpetuate a drug war that's damaged the poorest people with the least opportunities. So the proposal would limit the number of plants that an individual could own uh, to six, which is actually pre pretty generous here in Canada where mm -hmm. we only have four. Uh, and it would also require consumers to register for a government license. And that's a step that advocates could say would discourage legal use and leave customers likelier to stay in the illegal market. Now, I don't know about you, Dean, but I would also be hesitant, especially at the start of legalization, to apply for a license. Um, and, you know, in a country like Mexico, where uh, there is worry among people that the they could be tracked, um, that information can and could be used against them. Uh, that really is a, a large hindrance to a thriving legal market, in my opinion. Well, it's, uh, you know, it, the, the criminal element, I think, is much stronger, I think we can say, in, in Mexico than it is in cannabis, mm -hmm. uh, than in Canada when it comes to, to cannabis. Um, and the, the one thing that this also, um, the people have a problem with is, it doesn't regulate medical cannabis, it, you know, it basically and, and the medical cannabis situation in Mexico is just a giant 
tire fire. It's a dumpster fire. It's a, it's a mess, and this does nothing to it. It's only looking at recreational marijuana and and hemp. So you know, while the the door is open to crack, it certainly seems like there is a lot of work to be done on this still, David. And that's tricky because the timeline is tight. Uh, Mexico does have the benefit of being able to consider current international models for legalization. So they've looked at Uruguay, Canada, and some of the U.S. states and uh, borrowed a little bit from each. As you say, bringing medical into it is extremely important. And it also uh, recognizes that cannabis is, uh, you know, not just for fun, though it is, Mm -hmm. but is also medicine. Yeah, this will this will be something. Um, you know, at, at some point, I hope to be able to go to Mexico and not have to buy shitty weed on the beach, uh, like I've had to do every time <laughs> I go there. I can actually buy some good legal weed. So, if this does, uh, you know, and 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 it has to work for for the for the people. It can't just be uh, let's legalize cannabis and corporations get richer. I mean, this is a a cash crop that should be able to be enjoyed and cashed in on by everybody. So certainly a lot of work to do there. Um, And obviously they've been looking at the Canadian system, which has good news. Uh, When you look at, you know, recent statistics, uh, cannabis sales on arrow up right now, uh, at least for the month Mm. of uh, September. And and I think that uh, should continue as we see more and more new products coming out. This is a continuation of a trend. And as you said, legal cannabis sales are continuing to march upward. Statistics Canada has reported that Canadian retailers sold $256.3 million worth of cannabis products in September. And that's a 1.8% bump up from August. Uh, Ontario is leading the way with a 5.3% sales increase up to $77.9 million in September, with Quebec and Alberta also reporting modest gains. Uh, Ontario, of course, has been adding more brick and mortar, and that seems to be a big factor when it comes to increasing sales of legal cannabis. Now, as we like to pick apart good news stories, BNN is speculating that the latest numbers are actually a sign that cannabis sales may be plateauing in Canada. Um, They're saying that despite the steady gain in the country's licensed cannabis operators, more brick and mortar, the three provinces are reporting monthly sales declines in September. And that's the first time that's happened in more than three months. Uh, You know, one of the factors that could very well contribute to that is that it's a homegrown season. So Mm. we're seeing more people growing at home. uh, And, you know, it's the second year that people have been able to do it legally. So chances are that some of those folks have actually been getting better crops. And here in BC, there are places where we've had phenomenal weather for homegrown cannabis. Um, You know, pricing has also become more competitive, and that's a reason why we've been seeing sales go up. And uh, also, a lot of observers are saying that many of the Cannabis 2.0 products that are out there now are higher quality than what you could find through uh, legacy illicit channels. So that's something, too. You got price going down and quality going up, and that tends to mean that consumers are more interested in purchasing the legal products. Uh, now, some of some of the ways that we could look at continuing the growth are urging the federal government to look at uh, you know, things like cutting taxes um, mm. and also allowing allowing things like delivery. And you know that would those would be things that would keep the momentum moving forward. Indeed, uh, especially in I don't know you know what it's like where you live, but uh, here in Alberta, particularly in the Edmonton region, you know. There's a lot of talk about the lockdown coming back in and you know things not going well. well. Delivery would just be so perfect. We've talked about this in the past, about the elderly and being a, a growing demographic, and we don't want them to have to go out to get their cannabis. Let's get it to them as it was an essential service. Now, the one thing about the home growers that, that I actually love is that, yeah, maybe somebody or a lot of people are growing at home, and that's bringing the, the, st- the sales down at retail stores, but they still had to pay for the equipment to grow and the things like that. So it's still generating income for the entire industry and spawning something new. Let's get more people encouraged because maybe that leads them getting into the cannabis business because they like growing. I think it's all good news, whether it's you know sales going up or more people growing at home, if, if that is indeed the case. 
Yeah, and we're see definitely seeing an increase in the service side of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we saw LPs growing uh, in the first phase. We started to see retail really kicking up in the second phase. And now the third phase, we're starting to see some of those service sides. Yeah, people who are providing supplies for home growers, uh, those who are working to help... Uh, you know, the different businesses to advertise or use social media in a way that's responsible. So, you know, like you said, this is just working, helping the economy move forward, uh, especially in a tough time that we're seeing right now in the COVID recession. All right. And then you have this next story uh, that is, uh, you know, all fabricated uh, to try to throw a wrench or a wrench or a wedge into the uh, into the cannabis world and, and politics in general. And we're talking about Peter McKay and the ridiculous outright lies that he tweeted out. To, I think it was over the weekend. I, I, I just told him he was full of bullshit uh, because he is. The, <laughs> the, the tweet is, is, is there's zero to back up what he tweeted out. Well, Peter McKay has made no secret of the fact that he does not like cannabis uh, and legalization in particular. So he's spouted off about legalization in Canada in a reply to a tweet from The Economist uh, about legalization happening in Mexico. And he says, I'll quote, it surely has not gone well in Canada. The black market and criminal element is flourishing. The negative impacts on mental health and increased addictions are starting to be felt. Well, national productivity slips further. Why did we do this again? With two question marks, uh, like a, 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 you know, it's like you said, this is all fabrication. Where is this information coming from? The black market is not flourishing. In fact, legal cannabis sales have surpassed illicit sales. That's according to St Statistics Canada. And we're seeing those numbers continually go up. Now, according to the Calgary Sun, there's actually been a decrease in cannabis use by youth since legalization. And when we're talking about increased mental health issues and cannabis causing a decrease in national productivity, I mean, McKay might as well have cited the boogeyman because his source of those <laughs> claims is just as made up. Um, and, you know, this isn't the first time that he's spouted off about his off base views on legalizing cannabis and during the conservative party leadership race back in February, which he lost by the way, uh, for good reason, because Peter McKay couldn't keep Peter McKay's foot out of Peter McKay's mouth. Indeed. Uh, he lost Aaron O'Toole and he told a newspaper here in my backyard, the Cologne daily courier that he doesn't support legalization. And he'd further called it at the time, a complete failure. Um, you know, again, reinforcing these same views. He said he worries most about the impact on young people, the mental health implications, the impaired driving implications. By the way, impaired driving has not, in fact, gone up and the sky has not fallen. And he said that the legalization plan was forced and it was a back of a napkin promise. That's what he said at the time. Now, let me just say that we're seeing social conservatism here. That's that's what Peter McKay is really bringing to the forefront now true fiscal conservatives on the other hand actually love legalization i mean it provides a brand new market that boosts the economy and yeah. for conservatives who seem to be so against crime law and order you know here we are actually reducing and eliminating a lot of crime by bringing something into legalization and into an orderly framework this was my reply to uh peter mckay i said uh, the conservative party plans on raising the gst to 50 percent getting rid of health care and having canada become the 51st state of the usa see i can make up outrageous bullshit statements without proof also be better or shut up because it's stupid we could all go out and like you said it's based on the boogeyman it's lies there's there's no merit to it and all he's doing is trying to spread more fear. He's just fear mongering. That's that's all he is doing. And and like you said, this is a tired argument. Like this is tired. Like get on the 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 cannabis train. You don't have to smoke cannabis, but you can recognize the at least economic benefits that are there. If at the very least, it's just 
It's just silly that this man continues this ridiculous fight when it's clearly losing. I mean, the amount of people that uh, are against cannabis are basically the same amount of people that support them. Like, it's, it's silly. It's, it's, it's only them. <laughs> you know, back when I did the story about his statement to the the Daily Courier, I dug through his Facebook uh, for a good photo to use to highlight the story. And there he was cracking beers with our uh, former prime minister, Stephen Harper. Yeah. And it just goes to show that double standard. It's like you said, you don't necessarily have to smoke cannabis to support it, but there should be a recognition that cannabis is a good way to unwind. And I said it already today. It's medicine, my friend. Mm -hmm. And if you don't recognize the economic benefits, then then you should have no be nowhere near anywhere close to running our country. So anyway, let's move on uh, to another story that also uh, involves government. And this is something that we've been talking a lot about because the Cannabis Act will be up for review after three years. Uh, there are people already working ahead to start to get those conversations because, you know, you start reviewing in a year, well, whatever you decide isn't coming in for a year and a half or a year later. So we need to get on this right away because there are regulations that are certainly holding things back in this industry. Mm -hmm. We took a look at uh, sustainably grown cannabis and whether that's something that's being supported um, by policy and regulations, which we found it really is not. So producing the greenest cannabis is still in its infancy. Um, that's what growers and advocates are saying. Michael Reichs is the master grower at Good Buds, uh, which is a craft certified organic cannabis farm on Salt Spring Island, BC. He says that sustainability was easier in the legacy market and that current health Canada regulations make it really tough. Uh, it's not impossible if companies are taking the initiative, uh, but still he's citing things like packaging requirements and microbi mic microbial limits. Ooh, that's a tough one to say. It is. Uh, it, and you know, basically his farm, um, Good Buds is currently growing indoors and outdoors in a greenhouse. The whole facility is running off collected rainwater and natural springs, which is such a great sustainable step. And, you know, his comments are echoed by other people in the industry. Lisa Campbell, she runs the cannabis sales and marketing agency, uh, Mercari Agency Limited, and they work with licensed cannabis companies to help them get their products to market. She says that cannabis is a very intensive activity when you're growing indoors and that outdoor growing is actually the most sustainable way to grow it. You basically using the power of the sun. Who knew? <clears throat> now she says that for a lot of those craft outdoor BC farmers that are growing on the mountainside in living soil, if there's any kind of microbial contamination, it's actually really hard for that flower to come to market. So there are roadblocks in the way of being more sustainable. And she says that really nothing short of an industry and consumer revolution where people are demanding sustainable cannabis uh, is going to change things. That there needs to be education to help both government and consumers understand why outdoor organic cannabis is just as high quality as indoor hydroponic. Uh, you know, a third source here, we have Kelly Coulter, who co-founded the Normal Women's Alliance of Canada, and she's comparing the cannabis to the three waves of coffee, which is a really interesting way to look at it. And coffee is now in its third wave where independent and artisanal coffees become the norm. And that's compared to its early stages of mass production uh, and mainstream coffee shops. So cannabis right now, uh, Kelly says, is on its first wave. We're in the very regulated early days. And she said that consumer deviation is going to be extremely important in the upcoming years to help develop uh, the most sustainable and diverse cannabis industry as possible. She says, if consumers don't care, it won't help the industry. So people need to pay more attention to what they're consuming. Indeed, man. And, you know, the the one thing I, I worry about is that, uh, you know, obviously we're only two plus years in, so the regulations are going to be strict. At some point, we think they're going to be relaxed. I do worry about a lot of the people doing a lot of the work right now that, you know, might not be able to make it through these strict regulations until they're relaxed. I, I think there's a real worry about that out there with a lot of companies. I think so too. It's a, it's a difficult industry to, uh, you know, move on in, especially if you don't have a, a vault full of cash 
because it does go up and down and we are seeing a lot of competition right now. So uh, it's been said before and consumers really do have the power to vote with their wallet uh, and you do a little bit of research into the products that they're consuming. And if you care about being sustainable, if you care about the environment, if you care, care about packaging and the way things are being done, you know, vote with your wallet. Uh, and also don't hesitate to send an email to your MP explaining mm -hmm. that that's a priority to you. Indeed. Uh, David, thank you as always. Uh, it's going to get down to about minus 17 with the wind chill here today. <laughs> Uh, this would be a perfect day for uh, an OZ2. Are you guys still giving those away? Yeah, we still are. Hey, I can I can show it off again this yeah. week because we've got the camera. So here's an OZ2. This one here is actually full of uh, the names of people who have entered our contest. Um, there's also a little box of Smarties in there because I've got a bit of a sweet tooth. Nice. But if you want to enter our draw, send an email to hello at okanaganz.com. And hey, tell us uh, tell us what you think of Peter McKay because I'd sure love to hear. Indeed, get yourself a toque and uh, probably get something off of their chest as well. David, as <laughs> always, thanks for joining us. We'll chat next week. Stay warm. You too, my friend.